Curmudgeons and Dragons back for another RPG Horror Stories episode. I got Josie, Jim, and Greg here. How y'all doing? Yo. Doing fine. Nice. Good so far. Welcome back to the round table. Let's see uh, how we do after the story. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> yeah. Let's, see, you've let's already just, said the president. I'm already afraid. Let's just. Let's I'm just, ready to be angry. Let's just take a second and just, you know, enjoy how happy <laughs> we may or may not be right now. Savor it as long as we can. And if things get funny in a second, they get funny in a second. <laughs> <laughs> just think of happy things like Animal Crossing and Stardew Valley. Uh, and players not being maliciously killed behind their backs and I'm not going to bring up Cody again. It's too soon. Uh, DM, <laughs> DM's actually doing prep. Oh, man. Just, a little bit of foreshadowing there. For oh, Jesus. I Uh-oh. already don't okay. like it. Okay, I'm enjoying myself too much. I'm ready to be brought down. Jim, what you got for me? Yeah, well, fuck me what up. I got is, I, I, I know that the standard format here is we go to the RPG Horror Stories subreddit. And, no, and that's, pick, that's just, that's just where the, the easiest place to find bits. them is. Okay, well, but so so, but but since I'm I'm, I'm new to the proceedings here, I figured I would lead off with my own personal RPG horror story. Yes, which I, I didn't experience directly, but this is a very good friend of mine who I've been gaming with for over twenty years, and this is their horror story. This is kind of our go-to RPG horror story. Whenever oh, this somebody is very exciting, you know, like is like, what was it like in the good old days, the classic days of D and D, when the you know the baby gamers ask us and stuff. This is just the a story shittery, like to, just with more with, cigarette smoke. Yes, yeah, no, like <laughs> so. Um, it's about a spe- so my RPG horror story is about a specific kind of bad game. Yes, and give that, us that is give us that OC. Give us that OC. The, it's the terrible convention game. <gasps> uh, so, I'm so this excited. one occurs. So this one occurs, and this is where I'm, I'm bringing my like old guy credentials to the show here. This one occurs 1998 at Gen Con, you know, the like like the biggest four days in gaming oh, or yeah. whatever they call it now. And this is when it was still in Milwaukee before it had moved to Indianapolis. Oh, wow. It was, you know, uh, kind of like it used to happen. And they call it Gen Con because it used to happen in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. It got too big for that, you know, home of Gary Gygax. They moved it to Milwaukee and I would have been 28, something like that. I don't know. Were, were, were you guys even born yet? Maybe. I, I don't know. Whatever, I was but. four. Four. There we go. Okay. I was, cool. I was in middle school. I was. Okay. Uh, I was getting right. my first. Uh, I was though. getting my first D and D books from the library that year. There we go. Perfect. Yeah. So. So I this was reading been, about cancer and poisonous plants. This would have been second second edition. So I was there with this good friend who I still game with today. This is a uh, friend of mine who is a actually you know what you you'd get a kick out of this Jason. He's one of the bigwigs at Star City. He does a lot of writing for Star City for the Magic site. What's his name? Um, uh, uh, Ferret Steinmetz. Uh, I'm not familiar with him, but I yes, know, yeah, uh, but, I, mean, I know some, he, I know some of the other staff there. Behind the scenes stuff and things like that as opposed sure, to like, sure. but, uh, yeah, to I met a lot of their like staff. That, but yes, yeah. So, uh, so anyways, this was when we were friends. We were both living in Ann Arbor because we worked for the Late Lamented Borders Bookstore. That's a, that's a retail horror story that I could tell is my involvement with Borders Bookstore. But uh, so there we were. We were there at Gen Con, Milwaukee, to play D&D in the heart of Gygax country and to experience the visceral thrill that could only be delivered by the world's greatest tabletop gaming convention. We were all there. We're, we're like super psyched to be there and, you know, ready to, to get into it. The game in question was, of course, second edition D&D at this point, and it was a Planescape game, which is arguably the greatest setting that D&D has ever released. Very high expectations going into this. Super excited about it. So this story is going to sound like like somebody was trolling or like they're deliberately trying to get themselves mentioned on this podcast. This is like 1998 before any of this kind of thing, you know, was out there in the world. So uh, podcasting was technically around. It wasn't called podcasting yet, and it was really just existed on like like the uh, like like Usenet groups. Yeah, sure. And it was whatever, a very like, underground, like, very nerdy uh, thing. Uploading way wave, more, wave way more files pirate to radio bulletin than boards it is and now. stuff like that. Sure. Yeah. I believe Secret it was radio called shows. Uh, Talkies. <laughs> oh my god. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> just just after they introduced sound to the internet. Yes. Yeah. Um but Listen, we're, so, we're still we were still on new grounds at that time, all right, man. <laughs> so I was waiting um, for a computer that can handle flash animation. So his first sign, getting back to my story, his first sign that there would be trouble was that there were like eight to ten players at the table around this table for a four-hour convention D&D game. 
which is just in and of itself, just kind of the lead off like a, a, a bad sign. I'm already now, so stressed out. Yeah. So like these older editions, you know, first like and second edition D and D ostensibly built to handle larger groups. But this was, like I said, a con game in a four hour slot. So the DM hands around a bunch of penciled in first level characters, like blank character sheets that they had printed out and then written in pencil, just the stats and just kind of handed them around. No names on them or anything like that. When my friend asks what the deal is, like, what's our backstory? What's going on? The DM says to him, well, you're an elf, right? And uh, he's a dwarf. So, uh, well, you guys hate each other. <laughs> and uh, that guy there, he's a human. So uh, you two probably don't get along too well either. And that was basically the sum total of the, you know, the background information that the DM was able to provide for, for these players. So seeing that this did not bode well for the game, unless he set out to make his own fun, my friend names his level one elven mage, walking the interdimensional mean streets of the city of doors, Flapjack. Stop! <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm into it. So Flapjack the mage, the guy next to him, who also sensed where this was going. And it was like, like right from the jump, the two of them were like, like looking at each other going, this is bad. We're going to have to get together if we're going to have fun with this. He names his barrier fighter Stomp. And barriers were like, uh, whatever, you know, kind of like, like, like half human. It's like a, a planescape race that were like, essentially like satyrs or something like that. So, but he had like big hooves. So he named him Stomp on account of, you know, his big feet. So because he called them stop. So so with everyone statted up, the game gets underway and the DM announces that they're all there in sigil, this amazing, rich, you know, planescape setting with all of these factions and all that kind of stuff that are important to the game. And they're in an alley. And they spend a couple of seconds trying to figure out why they're in an alley and what's going on when they are attacked by giant rats. Wait, why are we in this alley? What's going on? The DM doesn't have an answer for them, but he does ask if anyone has a monster manual so that he can look up the stats for the giant rats that are attacking them. <laughs> oh my uh, has anyone got a monster manual? You know, realizing he, he like spends a couple minutes looking through his bag and stuff, realizes he doesn't have his own monster manual and asks somebody for a monster manual. Meanwhile, he's so at Gen Con and there's probably a thousand of them. Exactly. So you can flip it open and look for it. But yeah, I mean, like, like people had monster manuals, but like, this is like, you know. Like, um, bitch, you wrote this. And not only wrote it, but like you, you bought a plane ticket and spent <laughs> money for a hotel room. <laughs> and like, this is what you're presenting to people. This is, you know, this is the, the best that you have to offer. You're putting forward for these folks at this con. So the combat gets underway. And the party, the first level party in Sigil, like Planescape, I think, recommended that you started, you know, you start players higher level just because of the way the setting works. But so they immediately start getting slaughtered by giant rats. So they elect to flee the alley. Uh, the DM describes how they, uh, you know, like, like they kind of run around the corner. And then the DM describes how they run into a big patch of razor vine. And for anybody familiar with the Planescape setting, Razor Vine is this thing in Planescape that's this like interdimensional plant that's basically a cross between kudzu and concertina wire. So it's like it grows everywhere and the leaves are like razor sharp blades and the thorns can punch through armor and stuff like this. It's this, I mean, it's kind of a way if you want to have a place where you just want to, like, by fiat, say the players can't go there. You just throw a bunch of uh, razor vine up in front of there, you know, and it's like a D, it's, you know, it's like in a video game where you hit a wall that you can't pass. So that's kind of like the function that that serves, you know, people in Sigil put it on their walls and their houses and stuff. So you can't climb into places. But, you know, this is where they are. They're stuck between the rats on one side that are kind of, you know, just sort of biting them to death and the razor vine on the others where they're getting slashed up. So, Figuring it's risk a few cuts or become lunch for rats, they they they're just like screw it, we'll just climb it up. How bad can it be? And they all get just cut to ribbons. Well, yeah, as the tr you know trying to get away, trying to get out of this alley that the game started in. So the DM calls for a break at this point and says, 
he'll think about what to do next because he's not quite sure where to proceed from here. My friend Always takes this opportunity to take his character sheet, flip it over, and just as big as he can, scrawl on it, Flapjack is dead. And just prop, kind of props it up in front of his seat and flees before the DM can get back from the can. So, <laughs> Incredible. So now some, yeah, so whenever some baby gamer talks about how cool it must have been to play old school in the birthplace of <laughs> D&D, we are happy to disabuse them of that notion. Like it was, there were ways, it could be just as bad then as it can be now. And there's no universal, you know, standard for any of that kind of stuff. But that's, Throughout that's my history. personal, yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, there history, all, everybody's just horrible all the time. <laughs> yeah, there has always almost, been uh, that guy. It's almost like that back, people. Yeah, back to the dawn of the back to the dawn of the game. So when like OSR people will tell you, will wax nostalgic about how great gaming used to be. Eh, no, no, good. I mean, good games are good games regardless of when they happen. But terrible games were happening right back from you know the very beginning of the hobby. So that is my personal. Uh, RPG horror story, uh, but adjacent, personally adjacent RPG horror story. The terrible, terrible convention game. What's your opinion on? So you said like you know bad games are bad games, and things were you know, could, could still have absolutely been bad then. You know, ni- ninety eight. We're we're talking like you know AOL was barely in people's houses. Like mm-hmm. you, like you would go to your friend's house to go yep to go use their internet. Is that the year that Google came out? Uh, close, Maybe. probably. So. The, the idea of an online community wasn't wasn't a thing. So we're talking like, you no, know, even even late nineties like that, or would be early nineties, eighties, seventies when this when this game was like, you know, fresh. And you couldn't have DMs jumping on Reddit and being like, How can I handle something like this? How can okay. I make sure all my players are having the best time? Sure. But in night so in nineteen ninety eight, D and D had been around for twenty five years, mm-hmm. right? Ninety eight. And we all had like two hundred issues of Dragon magazine with sage advice columns and people writing in and all that kind of stuff, you know, those resources were out there to find. Yes. Um, and like just the, 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 the level of total indifference to the fact that like, it's one thing if you run a shitty game for your friends, that can happen sometimes. You have an off night or you're all figuring out how to play and stuff like that. But like I said, this person spent money to come here and be, and be there a shitty and do DM. that exactly yeah. for a bunch of strangers was just that is Sucker the thing that I find free. so astonishing about it. Yeah, right. I, and the reason, like, and yes, I, and I've had I had issues of Dragon Magazine. I was more into Scry because I was a Magic player, but um, and, and Quest. But yeah, Dragon but was yeah, absolutely like, a thing. You know, zines and stuff were out there, and you know, if you wanted to, that Gen Con, you know, going back to. There were probably two dozen seminars that you could go and sure. sit down at to become a better DM if you and, wanted to do that. Like and those seminars are what, what you're paying go. for. That's what yeah. you're paying for. That's why you go. Exactly. Yeah. It was just we we were astonished. I mean, to the extent that I remember that anecdote, you know, like 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 nearly two and a half decades later, yeah. and he and I will will you know still laugh about that. Like if if the conversation gets quiet and one of us just wants to make the other one laugh, we'll just say, "Flapjack is dead," and we'll just <laughs> both start cracking up because <laughs> we were both there for that, uh, and that was kind of all we talked about the rest of the weekend was how awful that game was. Well, just make sure you have a monster manual or at least stat blocks for the things that you're throwing at your players in the first five minutes. Yeah, I should. Yeah. Be yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I also really want to know what was the level of like LARP costuming like at the convention in 1998? Like were people dressed to the nines or were they just in like jeans and t-shirts? That's very important to me. I mean, there, there, there were some people that would show up in costume and stuff like that, but there certainly wasn't the, I mean, one of the things that the, you know, that the internet does for you is gives you, you know, you can compare with each other, but I mean, in 1998, everyone was uh, learning to make their own costumes, you know, in their own little silos because mm-hmm. you couldn't just go online and go, here's the best way to make armor and just get, you know, two videos of that. Yeah, you had to figure it out. I mean, and, you know, and the big thing about 98, about like that era is 
you were in a lot of ways limited to what you could buy locally as well. Mm -hmm. the, the infrastructure that we think of today as like, I can order anything I want from anywhere and they ship it to your house was not in place at that time. So whatever yeah. you were putting together, you were doing, you know, kind of on your own. Yeah, a lot so, of trips, a lot of trips to a uh, rag shop for your, uh, for your fabrics. But yeah, that was the place that, but certainly there were like costume parades and stuff like that, that they would have at those cons and everything. So, you know, I mean, pe people were into it certainly back then. So there's actually somebody that goes to my school who I'll see maybe like once a week or every other week who to go to classes kind of dresses like an elf mage. So I think I might go to school with Flapjack. <laughs> I'm like, I'll see them on the bus and I'll be like, That's you're fantastic. in a full, like, like a robe with a cloak mm -hmm. and you've got the ears on like, that's awesome. Wow, what class are you in? <laughs> That's awesome. I and, also and went to college with someone who had like the elf ears and the robe every day. And it's like, fucking follow your joy, I guess. That's awesome. And, and people will look funny at them, but not at some douchebag who's wearing like somebody else's football jersey. Oh, yeah. Uh, no, you know, I look at them just with just like dumbstruck adoration. Else. So, yeah. I'm just yeah. like, I saw. I don't know you, but can we be friends, please? <laughs> I saw a quote the other day, uh, fantasy football is bad or is for people who are both bad at fantasy and football. <laughs> <laughs> fantasy football but great is at gambling. Disgust. My drummer yeah. a few bands ago was like super into fantasy sports. And I'm like, you realize that's just D&D for jocks. And he 1000% would not listen to like any of the lots and lots of explaining that I had to do to him very slowly. And uh, oh my god, like, oh, I can is. just picture him just shutting down, eyes glazed over, be like, I will not be associated with he just refused culture. to he just refused to accept it, and then that was it. I played I played and then he left the band in high school. Are you familiar with Stratomatic? <laughs> I'm not. This no. is so so in the like 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 back in the eighties and nineties. I mean, I'm sure that they still make it now, but it was sports games with all the players' stats on cards. And so like your team was a stack of cards. And then when you played the game, you, you know, you went through, you rolled dice and you played a baseball game. And in the original Stratomatic, the player's stats would have, you know, like, you know, you'd roll 2d6 and it would it would have, you know, like weighted results. And then within those 2d6 results, you might get, you know, on a 1 to 12, it's a fly out. But on a 13 to 20, it's a home run. And the way Stratomatic did it was they had little, like a basically like a little deck of chits that they called flip cards, where you would flip it over to get the number, and then you'd shuffle it every time to randomize it. And I, you know, started playing Strato, and I looked at that and I went, uh, "If you guys need a random number from one to twenty, um, <laughs> there's a much better way to do this." And so I had Roll the, the dice. I had the jocks in high school carrying around d20s in their pockets. <laughs> Because Amazing. it was the easiest way to play Stratomatic because a, a game of baseball, you could play in 15 minutes. You could just, you know, play when you were supposed to be in study hall or something like that. You whip your, you know, it's whatever, you know, the 10 or 11 players, it, you know, the regular nine and a couple of extra pitchers. You just pull it out of your back pocket and throw down. But yeah, that was, I, I always, one of my proudest moments was getting the, the high school, you know, the captain of the baseball team to carry a D20 around in his pocket. Um, the, Power not move. under. I Not necessarily that. understanding what you know, <laughs> what it was. He used doesn't for need to understand. The the time. Exactly, that was the important thing. Was, was right. that was that it was it was there. So yeah. all he needed all right. to know was that he could use it. Jim, I would love to get more convention stories, and even just talk about your history in in conventions. We're gonna have a whole episode about that. Oh yeah, yeah. I've, I've, so I've been to a few cons. But <laughs> I've, 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 yeah, I've, I've been to I've been to well over a dozen Gen cons and a yeah. whole lot of other cons because I I used I'm to sell. So jealous. Well, I mean, I, I I still do, you know, on a freelance kind of basis, working for some of my friends. I mm -hmm. sell games at cons for many, many years. So, so yeah, well, I, I want to get like really into that and like, uh, and even just like the experience of cons throughout the years, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're, we're going to have a, a much longer conversation about that in another episode. For sure. Yeah. But, I got, uh, I, I think I've, I've got a con coming up myself in just a couple of weeks. In fact. Where are you going? <gasps> going to a convention called Total Con, which is in Massachusetts, just outside of Worcester. It's a con I've been to a bunch of times. I'm going to go. I'm going to run a couple of games. I got a bunch of games that I'm going to be playing. I'm going to be playing Ghostbusters, which nice. is fun. Mm -hmm. Ghostbusters RPG. Yeah, we'll hear about those my, on a uh, on a Just Played episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll definitely be talking about some of those games. So for sure. Right. 
Guys, thanks for hanging out. We're going to pour one out for Flapjack. All right. <laughs> oh, wait, wait. Fun. Flapjack is dead. Flapjack is dead. Now. Rip Flapjack. Thank you for listening to Commudgeons and Dragons. Please share this with your favorite adventurers. Leave a review on Apple and follow us on social media. All links can be found at curmudgeonsanddragons.com. Practice safe adventuring, my friends. This has been a JTP Audio Podcast. Thanks for listening.